afternoon. I've had the privilege um, a few times in my life to have been invited uh, by Professor Giles Gunn to participate in one or other of his projects. I have never refused. Um, however uh, pressed the schedule, I knew that an invitation from Professor Gunn is always an invitation to think beyond my, the boundaries of my own thought and most often beyond the terrains that have been well settled, cultivated, hoed, plowed by others. Giles Gunn only issues such invitations. So you know that when he invites you, you've got to work bloody hard and try and think as best you can. Of course, you can only think as best you can. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some thoughts uh, this afternoon. My debt uh, to Giles is deep, but like all debts, certainly like all American debts, it's a continual, exponentially expanding situation. And of course, even as I speak today, I'm incurring yet another debt because the, the, my talk does not, in fact, directly engage this great project of yours on the reorientation or the repositioning of America internally and externally. Uh, it does deal with some of the underlying issues that I believe speak to this matter. And it does so by trying to focus on the problem of transition as a historical, an aesthetic, conceptual, poetic measure. This work on transition spans the two books that I'm working on at the moment. A book that came out of the Du Bois lectures that I delivered at Harvard four years ago, and the Wellick lectures that I delivered more recently. And since publishers now uh, generously dictate the way we think, I'm not allowed to write one book, which is what I should write, but I have to write two books because they're all committed. I now have to give the Clarendon lectures at Oxford next year, and they demand a third book. So one has to write three books. One large book is three books. But this thread of transition is something that I'm very interested in. How do you think about transition? How do you work with transition? How do you actually write about a transitional phenomenon? And I've been very interested in it from the psychoanalytic uh, perspective for a while. Um, this time, it's not that work that I'm presenting, but very open to discussing uh, the work of Winnicott, for instance, which even the work of Klein, which has been very important to me to try and think of these interstitial, interstitial or transitional spaces. But let me just, um, to just reduce my debt somewhat um, to Giles Gunn and say uh, a few things on your more general project, just to link with it before I start. The use of metaphoricity now to establish ideology and hegemony is extremely important because what metaphor and what figurative language communicates and carries with it is the charge of affect. Um, it is the garb of truth. It is the way in which people feel not only persuaded rationally, but passionate. They are made passionate or they're made um, um, they're given zeal. So I think the language of metaphoricity has to be seen very much as part of the whole question of agency, whether that is productive and progressive or retrograde and reactionary. So I suggest in response to what Giles mentioned that the whole question of metaphoricity and figurative language, the old versus the new, I'll be talking about that. Um, Democracy, 
versus uh, tyranny, uh, the way in which these ideas are now being put forth in metaphor and in figurative language is really to create a kind of political agency, but also to mobilize with it a psychic uh, uh, identificatory structure. Now, my general theme of transition is one which I feel um, is a state of mind, a state of language, uh, a state of political being that much of the rest of the world is concerned with. Wherever I go and wherever I travel, um, people seem to be talking about their lives, their societies, as if they are, as if they have been over the last decade, but certainly since 9-11, going through a rapid and in some ways confounding period of transition. In India and in the whole South Asian region, India and Pakistan, the impact of 9-11, the impact of the Afghanistan adventure, but also the impact of global technologies and financial markets is certainly creating a sense of transition. People are talking about their experiences as if they are in this corridor, as if they are in what Walter Benjamin called uh, in his description of translation as a continua of transformation. There is, of course, another aspect in the South Asian region where transition becomes fundamentally associated with the emergence of a new kind of ethno-nationalism in India and the whole problem of Islamic fundamentalism in Pakistan and the management of these emergent and very virulent ideas and ideologies creates a sense in the region as I experience it that there is a profound kind of transition going on irrespective of the economic and financial successes and the technological successes, outsourcing, the Silicon Valleys all over the, the Asian region that, that we hear more of. In Europe, of course, the European Union is itself um, in the fine print and in the larger idea creating a sense of transition, but now there is, of course, a new one. The Europeans are trying to find their feet um, in a situation where there is a split between the pro-U.S. positions and effectively the anti-U.S. positions. So there's another kind of split, another kind of unease opening up. I don't think I need to go through the geopolitical map to suggest to you that in Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, of course, the language of transition and how you deal with it in terms of social structures, cultural values, social values, the future, are very much in people's minds. In the US, however, I think there is a profound denial of the fact that, there, that it is part of this geopolitical, global phenomenon of transition. There is here, unfortunately, um, a sense of reinforced traditionalism, foundationalism, and exceptionalism as the taxi driver who took me to Logan this morning said he was from the Lebanon, he'd been here 22 years. He said he had never felt these things as virulently as he had in the last four years. My neighbors, he said, turn against me and ask questions, are suspicious in ways that they haven't been in 15 years. Why? Why now? 
Giles Gunn talked about the, the impact of culture in the construction of the American Imperium. And I would like to suggest that the notion of security is now not simply a political issue, but a cultural issue. Security is the lens through which you look at somebody and decide whether they're good Muslims or bad Muslims, whether they're terrorists or not. Security has become a rich cultural lens now, and I think we should see it as such. One of the ways in which we think of difference now, one of the ways in which we think of identity now, is through the lens and through the technologies of security. Not simply security as surveillance, but this as an idea that somebody who is next to us, somebody who is proximate to us, somebody who is away from us or distant from us, is a security threat. Security has become a cultural, a fully cultural apparatus. So coupled with what I have called the resistance to the idea that the US is part of, an agent of this very transitional process, coupled with that, there is the screening or masking of the denial which creates a profound paranoia. Some call it a zealous patriotism, um, but let us talk about it as paranoia. And I think the problem with this paranoia is, like most other kinds of paranoias, that either things, the threat is always coming from outside, because the inside seems to be in some ways empty, or the threat comes from the enemy within. I think what paranoia psychically and psychoanalytically does not allow you to do, to put it very simply, is to see yourself as both the subject and the object of a process. It does not allow you to confront that dialogism, that internal ambivalence with which you negotiate an identity or a being. I think it cuts that off. So it's either all coming from the outside or there is some deep threat in the inside. It's this anxiety that I believe that the American government and its supporters do not want to enter into. I want to conclude these remarks connecting with Giles' opening remarks with just one um, anecdote. The year after September, uh, after 9-11, the World Economic Forum, the Davos meeting, was held in New York. Um, and I've been a fellow of the uh, World Economic Forum for the last three years, something that I'm often and rightly rigorously questioned on. In, from audiences just like this one. So uh, I'm open to questioning on what role I play. But let me just say that they organized a large panel chaired by Fred Schauer, the legal scholar from, at Harvard and Kennedy School, on the antagonism to America, on the hatred of America. And they had various people from all over the world, largely often from the Middle East, from Afghanistan, and a whole range of people to talk about why America was so hated. It seemed to me, however, that that was too comfortable a position. The fact is that individual speakers and audience members reacted violently in many ways, but it was clear from what they were saying that it was not simply that America was hated, but there was something more complicated than that, that the approach to the United States, the address to the United States, the attitude to the United States was deeply ambivalent. There was admiration and there was anger. There was fear 
and there was desire. It's that complex relationship that the US must learn to take responsibility for if it means to maintain the world role that it is now maintaining. It cannot create these kind of amnesias, it cannot create it, a sense of itself either as the victim or the, or, or the knight in shining armor. This country does not, in my view, understand the deep ambivalences that it creates in the world beyond it and the deep anxieties that, it's, that it provokes. The question of anxiety and ambivalence in the geopolitical field, in America's place in the world, brings me to my reflections on questions of transition in our time. This has added considerably to my talk. And now I have the job of trying to edit it while I'm in transition myself. <clears throat> I want to start with some words from Michel Foucault that I actually feel ambivalent about. But I thought that they were quite prescient. Um, and I so loved the title of the essay that I had to give them to you. These words come from a piece by Foucault called For an Ethic of Discomfort, which he wrote in 1979. We are witnessing a globalization of the economy, quite possibly. A globalization of political calculations, without a doubt. But a globalization of political consciousness, certainly not. You can see he's deeply ambivalent himself. Beyond our historical differences or similarities, we share a deeper experience of time. Time as the narrative construction of temporality underlies and accompanies the historical event. And although it is difficult to experience time outside concrete ages, eras, periods, appointments, anniversaries, life stories, there is more to time than events. It has frequently been said after September 11 that the global world came of age in the early hours of that day in a dark and disfigured way. Early that morning, the new millennium su suddenly faced the burning towers in New York, and in the years that have followed, we have been witnessing the ferocious unfolding of the war against terror, which has the potential to entirely undo the world as we know it, and indeed, as we would like to know it. Coming of age is a, curious phrase, is a curious phrase to describe a phase of life in which, legal formalities aside, adolescence and adulthood grapple uncomfortably on the threshold of history, both claiming the key to the door. But the door of history is neither open nor closed. The future that lies on the other side of the threshold is also a corridor to the past, and the present is a frame that gives shape to the transition of times, the past and the present, the past as the present. The sense of transition that I'm trying to induce from the coming of age narrative, the surprising juxtapositions of the old and the new, the past and the present, the poor and the rich, the guilty and the sa saved, are everywhere evident in the global world picture today. In every decade there are events that transcend their times and others that survive their histories. This is not a distinction between triumph and failure. It may be better understood through an oceanic metaphor 
as the difference between a wave that rises to define the horizon, coming to light as it catches the eye, and a deep current that moves under the surface, a forceful undertow felt inchoately as pressure rather than presence. What kind of an event is globalization? What would a global measure be? Such questions, it used to be said, could only be answered in the fullness of time, but perhaps ours is now, that threadbare time, filled with the fear of terror, violence, insecurity, and anxiety. For our dream of difference and diversity is now turning into a kind of haunting of horror about the very feasibility of global politics with the increase in homeland security and international surveillance, doubts about the very deterritorialized flows of global terror networks that use the same technologies and information economies as financial networks. The global cunning of world markets must not be underestimated. Nor, however, should the world's trade zones be celebrated, as, it is, as they are often now, as a bricolage of borderless bazaars, differences of commodities, populations, cultures, and so forth, which seem to multiply infinitely in the world market. The time for such global celebration is over. Financial markets and capital flows have been disproportionately globalized in comparison with other important sectors of the world economy, but nowhere near the extent to which the rhetoric of global cultural studies claims. At a rough estimate, almost 90% of all worldwide trade policies and tariffs are still controlled by nation states rather than interregional bodies. The European Union and Mercosur are exceptions to this global trend, setting their tariffs according to what is known as customs union regulations. But this represents only a modest variation in the persistence of trade barriers across the world. The rhetorical zeal with which it is claimed that world markets are now post-national needs to be tempered by a measure of historical reality. A much more mixed and muddy picture emerges in which the sovereignty of national control is only partially yet strategically compromised. When cultural critics argue with increased regularity that postmodernism is the logic of global capital or that the world market establishes a real politics of difference, Hart and Negri, they seem to turn the world into a metaphor of mondialisation in which the persistence of national or international governance is wrongly seen as the remnant of an archaic atavistic force. Such arguments work through analogy by equating the conceptual language of cultural globalization with select aspects of the political economy, commodification, financial flows, capital transfers, outsourcing, flexible accumulation. These economic and financial processes seem to resonate with the semiotic vocabularies of cultural studies. The circulation of commodities, the opening up of free trade zones, the technological transfer of financial flows bear a certain formal and rhetorical resonance with the circulation of images, the exchange of cultural signs, the excess of signification, the intertextual transfer of meaning. The elements of the global economy and polity that can be read under the sign of semiotic circulation or fragmentation are then mobilized for a wider political and ethical argument that suggests that the goal of global citizenship lies, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri write, and I quote, in the struggle against the slavery of belonging to a nation, an identity, and a people, and thus the desertion from sovereignty and the limits it places on subjectivity is entirely positive. Nomadism and miscegenation appear here as figures of virtue, the first ethical practices on the terrain of empire." End of quote. 
Now, such an emancipatory ideal, so affixed on the flowing, borderless global world, neglects to confront the fact that migrants, refugees, and nomads don't merely circulate. They need to settle, claim asylum or nationality, demand housing and education, assert their political, economic, and cultural rights, and come to be legally represented. It is salutary then to turn to less circulatory forms of the economy, like trade and tariffs, or taxes and monetary policy, which are much less open to metaphoric or analogic appropriation. And yet taxation or trade tariffs are no less a matter for cultural globalization, which places the problems of migration and the accelerated movement of peoples and things at the heart of a new global economy and polity. Indeed, to the extent to which global equality and justice demands the free flow of peoples and goods, taxation, properly levied for redistributive ends, such as in the global Tobin tax, has a crucial role to play in providing migrants and the poor with social welfare and public goods, medical care and educational benefits at the national level. Positive global relations depend on the protection and enhancement of these nation-based resources, which should then become part of the global political economy of resource redistribution and a transnational moral economy of redistributive transitional justice. Instead of suggesting that the very idea of a national economy is becoming meaningless, or that the world, and I'm quoting, or that the world market is liberated from the kind of binary division that nation states have imposed, as has recently been done, there is an argument to be made, partly in line with Richard Falk's suggestion, that in the transitional interim in which we live, and I quote, the emergence of a counter-politics in any serious form will involve reinvigorating and reconstructing a kind of reassemblage of the Westphalian system. A revision of the status and function then of the nation state system might be achieved through reconceiving of transnational minorities, I believe, as the empowering agents of global civil society. And really, my talk today as a global measure is around the notion of transition and around the notion of minorities. And I wanted to start with this um, I hope well-tempered and measured barrage against some of the more recent um, um, cultural global accounts uh, because it seems to me that um, we need really to integrate into our cultural account to find discursive and semiotic and signifying linkages with forms of the economy that don't immediately speak to the language in which we as literary and cultural scholars have been educated. And taxation, it seems to me, which is so much about representation after all, and about the inequities of representation, and about the ways in which um, representation works, taxation, it seems to me, is absolutely ripe for the post-structural cultural critics picking. And this is only a start to say that, I mean, I am doing quite a lot of work on, uh, on taxation and aspirational global taxes. Uh, taxes that may work, can work, taxes like the Tobin tax, which have been adopted by certain governments, but whether or not they work, they create a measure of economic, political and ethical thinking based on questions of equality and redistribution, they allow people to think of that while fully accepting the accelerated speed, to use Jacques Derrida's word, the accelerated speed that globalization presents in many of its sectors, in many of the sectors of its life world. So the, the Tobin tax is perfectly open to the fact that People, that investments in the world now, at the long, large investments spend possibly a week in one nation before being pulled out and put somewhere else. You know, spend about a week 
So the Tobin tax is not some kind of Luddite idea which says, you know, just let's get back to a different economy. It says, let's understand the slippages, the, 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 the volatility of the, the transitionality of the moment in which we live and let us see what, how we can work with that to construct some form of measure which is not essentialist, not foundationalist to use all the uh, uh, problematic terms, but yet provides us with an ethical and political measure. That's the kind of thinking that I'm doing and I've written at some length about uh, these aspects of the Tobin tax uh, or international redistributive global taxation. And the other interesting thing about these uh, measures is that if, that, that if they fail in some sense, if they're not adopted, they still create political movements around them and their ideals. This is the other thing. We're so used to thinking about a politics always of success. There are certain kinds of politics where you can fail strategically and yet create a different kind of uh, consciousness. And I think this is what Foucault was talking about when he talked about an ethic, an ethic of discomfort. <clears throat> now, in talking about the fact that we need to inscribe this mo moment of transition um, into our discourse, I think it's very well known to you that the cartographies, the new cartographies of globalism, the language of globa globalism is overdetermined and palimpsestical in ways that vacillate, mediate, and morph. To me, this sounds very much like Louis Althusser's interesting insight uh, in his essay, Elements for a Theory of Transition, when he describes transition as a temporal and structural duality represented as a mode of dislocation, the coexistence of two or more forms of production, cultural production, economic production, in a single simul simultaneity, and the dominance of the one over the other continually creating attention. Saskia Sassen, when she talks about the actual process of writing, of writing the economic history of globalization as a mode of transition, as she describes it uh, in her description of globalization, she says, globalization is the insertion of the global into the fabric of the national which creates a partial and incipient denationalization. In trying to then describe what she means by a partial and incipient denationalization as a way of actually constructing a theory, she gives us a footnote where she tells us what happens. She says, when you're trying to describe transition, there are such analytic moments when systems of representation intersect. Such analytic moments are easily experienced as moments of silence or absence. They're spaces that are constituted in terms of discontinuities. In them, discontinuities are given a terrain rather than reduced to a dividing line. Much of my work on economic globalization and cities has been focused on these discontinuities and has sought to reconstitute them analytically as borderlands or not as dividing lines. So it's this way of kind of really construct the text of transition as a form of writing and as a form of disciplinary um, knowledge um, making that is very important. Now we've heard again and again about the newness of globalization and newness I believe lives amongst us like the ghost of the future. Slender as a leaf of time turning, a sheet of space folding, inscribed on one side by the past and on the other by the present. When newness is read, as I am proposing, as a moment of transition, it emerges in our discursive world less as the inauguration of a new era and more appropriately as a turning point in history. The historically new is always a moment of incubation, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian political philosopher, suggests. What exists at any given time in the name of the new, he writes, is a variable combination of old and new and a momentary equilibrium of such cultural relations. 
Any global measure must be aware of the incubational nature of our historic moment, its peculiar transitional or translational existence between the old and the new, the historical presented and poised in a momentary equilibrium, the event of the past recalled and revived in the memory of the present. To conceive of the global as an incubatory event composed of analytic borderlines or disjunctive temporalities is not simply to make a rather complex statement about the ethnographic or epistemological conditions of the current world order. To represent the globe as a variable combination of old and new from the vantage point of, of a momentary equilibrium and transitional equilibrium is once again to force ajar that door of history with which I began. At that point, the issue of global temporality turns into an ethical and political project as the incubating variables of past and present, memory and history become translated into a consideration of human rights and human wrongs. A global or planetary perspective then becomes a proleptic aspirational project, a measure of justice and fairness grounded in the historical inequities and temporal dissonances of the present and therefore distinct from any utopian transcendentalism. There is something importantly processual and provisional about the proleptic approach to the ethics and politics of globalization that Gramsci immediately grasps when he writes that one should stress the importance and significance which in the modern world political parties have in the elaboration and diffusion of the conceptions of the world because essentially what they do what this conceptualizing of the world as a globe does is to work out the ethics and politics corresponding to these conceptions and act as it, as it were as their historical laboratory. To approach globalization then with the careful weighing and measuring of the historical laboratory rather than falling into the trap of celebrating newness and its exaltation of the present opens up the crucial question of seeking a measure of memory and symbolic representation across world events and geopolitical locations. Can there be ethical coefficients and comparables that enable us to negotiate the contingent and contextual specificity of historical events? Is universality the end of a process of historical and temporal judgment? What might global intersubjectivity be? <clears throat> Such questions of measured judgment, which I shall now explore in a reading of Adrienne Rich, could be seen as aspects of the discourse of global justice that Richard Falk again has called intertemporal equity and intertemporal rights. They emerge with some urgency in the life worlds of global civil society, Falk writes, and I quote, with the increased intermixing of the peoples of the world through various forms of transnational migration, which encourages a particularly strong motivation to communicate deeply felt grievances. There are some lines in Rich's remarkably prescient and pertinent work for this project, her book, An Atlas of the Difficult World, that performs the process of ceding some part of the sovereignty of the self and a national self-interest in order to establish something like a semblant global solidarity. It is not, in my view, a sentimental surrender or a philanthropic gesture to the rights of the others, nor, in my view, is Adrian Rich ventriloquizing a form of victimage. The poet works through the process of partializing the poetic person, splitting its first-person authority, sundering a foundationalist consciousness of first-world priority in order to articulate a family likeness that refuses facile forms of historical equivalence. The poetic meter and moral measure of the verse is maintained across a long history of rights and wrongs through a momentary equilibrium of voice that turns into an insistent and incessant repetition of what she calls ethical unsatisfaction in the midst of global equivocation. <laughs>
Let me read you a few lines which I will then interpret for you. Memory says, want to do the right thing? Don't count on me. I'm a canal in Europe where bodies are floating. I'm a mass grave. I'm the life that returns. I'm a table set with room for the stranger. I'm a field with corners left for the landless. I'm a man-child praising God he's a man. I'm a woman who sells for a boat ticket. I'm an immigrant tailor who says a coat is not a piece of cloth only. I have dreamed of Zion. I have dreamed of world revolution. I am a corpse dredged from a canal in Berlin, a river in Mississippi. I am a woman standing. I am standing here in your poem, unsatisfied. The insistent repetition of the phrase, I am, I am, I am, as in some bleak counting song of a monstrous child of our times, finds itself both implicated in the traumatic event of global histories, slavery, war, the Holocaust, migration, diaspora, peasant rebellions, revolutions, and yet unsatisfied in its attempt at imagining how one might stage a relationship to a world rendered restless by its transitional and transhistorical memories. When historic memory fails public morality, is the repetition compulsion, the beating rhythm of death, the only answer? Each line contains its own encrypted narrative in which the instability and silence of memory acts out its struggles for recognition. Rosa Luxemburg may be the corpse dredged from the Landswehr Canal in Berlin. The civil rights movement of the American South is invoked in the burning Mississippi. The immigrant tailor's plea, a coat is not a piece of cloth only, recalls Marx without naming him. The sacrifice of specificity is not a desire to generalize beyond the locality of history's happening. It is the pro provocation of the poetic impulse to work the lapses of memory into a revision, a resignification of the historical record. Rich struggles to find a way of establishing a narrative of what Hannah Arendt called human interest, to discover what lies in between these distinct, even disjunctive moments of speech and action that allows them to become affiliated with one another without being appropriated by an overarching sublatory sense of the predictability of progress. The repeated phrase, I am a table, a field, a man-child, a woman, an immigrant, does not seek to establish the sovereignty, I believe, of a representative world subject. Nor can the unsatisfied rhythm of repetition strive to restore some pre-configured normative sense of the good or the just or the free. The poem resists the equalization or neutralization of difference despite its roster of claims to the rights of representation, be it the immigrant, the refugee, the landless peasant, the Holocaust victim, the Jewish mother, the Palestinian woman, the Gastarbeiter, the sans-papier. What the poet articulates through the iterative energy of the verses, their restless repetition, is an interlocutory agency at once ethical and poetic, a fragile thing of family likeness, not to be found only in the static word pictures or images of historic traumas that are so strikingly conveyed. 
Family likeness is an engaged movement within naming and identification, within the shifting forms of life and language. I am standing here in your poem, unsatisfied. Is unsatisfaction the pessimism of the idealist or the aspiration of the utopian? The self-righteous indulgence of the betrayed dreamer the ethic and aesthetic of the unsatisfied, which restlessly drives the poet to try and shift her place in the poem and change her place in the world, is a persistent questioning of the very limits of history or freedom as knowable in advance of the intimate and individuated encounter with a predicated event or a poetic form. And yet predication and objectification, a canal, a mass grave, a field, deprives the subject of its ontological stability. I am, I am, I am, by suggesting that the attempt to find a global voice necessarily turns the subject back upon itself. The emphasis in the last line, I am a woman standing, standing in your poem, should not be passed over easily. For this is a particular kind of political stance, the standing of a kind of citizenship as a measure of public good, is respect and recognition, upon which Judith Schlar, for instance, founds her theory of American citizenship. Citizenship as standing arises from her insistent, insistence that as active citizens, we must vigilantly guard against the state's strategies of exclusion and de discrimination in the midst of its promises of formal equality and procedural democracy. These questions and problems return me to asking about the way in which a collective political body might be built on precisely such a sense of transition and such a notion of iteration and such a questioning of the place of the self in the global world. And this brings me back to the work of Gramsci. The political body that engages in such ethico-political projects is a cultural front, Gramsci says, a movement or alliance of groups whose struggles for fairness and justice emphasize the collaboration between aesthetics, ethics, and activism. In any case, Gramsci writes, the attitude to be taken up before the formation of the new state can only be critico-polemic, never dogmatic. It is a kind of balancing of classical composure with romanticism tinged with forbearance, which Gramsci in his critique of Croce gives importance to what he describes enigmatically as the philosophy of the part that always precedes the philosophy of the whole, not only as its theoretical anticipation, but as a necessity of real life. Gramsci's subaltern group, defined afresh, is a manifestation of the philosophy of the part as a necessity of political and ethical life. The subaltern strategy of counter-hegemonic power is replete with the nuance of the partial and the incipient. Indeed, its efficacy lies in knowing how to work with the moment of transition, how to turn the conditions of historical incubation into a form of interrogation and insurgency. The subaltern, Gramsci suggests, and I quote, is deprived of historical dominance and initiative. It is often in a state of continuous but disorganic expansion without a necessary party affiliation. Its authority may not go beyond a certain qualitative level which still remains at an oblique angle to the level of the possession of the state. Gramsci's relevance for our times lies in his being able to conceive of political and cultural agency that can be productive below the level of the possession of the state. Such a partial or interstitial identification with the nation state confronts and challenges the ethico-political terms of the state's authority while acknowledging the conditions and constraints of its power. Discourses that champion social contradiction as the a priori motor of historical change are propelled in a direction towards the terminus of the state. Subalternity represents a form of contestation or challenge to the status quo that does not homogenize or demonize the state in formulating an opposition to it. The subaltern strategy intervenes in state practices from a position that is contiguous or tangential 
to the authoritarian institutions of the state, not merely the notion of politics from above or politics from below. The historical space that opens up in the moment of transition is something that we have to confront now in redefining our global measure. Most writings on the expanse of globalization emphasize its excessive temporality, its acceleration rather than what I'm calling its transition, its intensification. As these measures work towards the immeasurable in discourses of globalization, I'm increasingly drawn to the photographer Alan Sekula's minimalist Zen-like utterance. A society, he writes, of accelerated flows is in certain key respects a society of deliberately slow movement. What does this mean for the world as we ought to know it? More than 80% of the world's cargo still travels by sea. Large containerized cargo ships today travel no faster than the first quarter of the century. Immigrant and refugee smuggling transports take months to deliver their contraband cargo, which may include 700,000 women and children that are trafficked each year, according to the US Justice Department, or the 200 million human beings that are believed to be in the hands of smugglers seeking entry for reasons of economic or political hardship into the global or transnational world. Immigration and asylum applications can take years to decide. In one recent case, a Sudanese asylum applicant was released after he had been in detention, awaiting a decision on his case for six years. Separated or unaccompanied minors who seek asylum as refugees can be held in detention in the US without recourse to their families for anything between six months to a year while their leave to stay is decided. I started this lecture with the metaphor of history's door held ajar, neither open nor shut, providing us with a perspective on a range of global measures to deal with the issue of transition. Redistributive taxation I talked about, intertemporal rights and equities, the poet's ethical unsatisfaction, and the ethico-political agency of Gramsci's subaltern subject. My purpose has been to illuminate, in some small measure, the theory and poetry of global transition as a site of freedom, aspiration, and advocacy. I want to end with some images of history in the making taken at the site of the Gachacha trials in Rwanda. If transition has been my theme, then let these representations of transitional justice bring my talk to a close, for they address a history that remains open or, in Adrian Rich's iterative sense, unsatisfied in its pursuit of measures of justice and fairness that must be implemented in the construction of communities and the constitution of political bodies. Such processes of truth and reconciliation are dimly visible in the Gachacha screening trials taking place in rural Rwanda today, which try and deal with the legacy of genocide. The growing impatient, impatience with the procedures and performance of the UN's well-meaning efforts to set up the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda has led the Rwandans to resort to what they call their grass mat or gachacha courts model on traditional practices of participatory justice. It is, as one observer reports, an emotional and judicial procedure allowing survivors to confront their tormentors face to face in a peculiarly transitional moment. And it is a transitional moment. It's the moment of the pre-screenings before the trials actually begin to try and gather at the moment testimonies to try and formulate the cases, so to speak, which will then be brought to trial in a year or two. As the most recent amnesty report abundantly testifies, the Gachacha experiment in regional judicial practice has serious shortcomings in the most crucial areas of participation and professional expertise. Just as the UN's more global effort, the ICTR, is both culturally 
and communicationally distant from the life world of the Rwandans. Is this too low a note to end on? I conclude with the gachacha process because it emphasizes the domain and discourse of rights and representations as ethical potential, as aspirational acts. And here I'm inspired by Amartya Sen's um, argument in freedom and development that we have to see rights in post-institutional, we must not only see rights in post-institutional terms as instruments, rather they should be seen as prior ethical entitlements. In this sense, human rights may stand for claims, powers, and, and immunities, and they may be supported by ethical judgments which attach intrinsic importance to these warranties. In fact, human rights may also exceed to the domain of potential as opposed to actual legal rights. And the Gachacha trials are precisely in this particular trans domain of transitional justice. I conclude with the Gachacha process because it emphasizes the domain and discourse of rights and representations as ethical potential. In our complexly wired world of mediations, there is no sustainable myth of the face-to-face. And yet, as I unravel the travails of global transitionality, I recognize the significance of the surfaces of historic memory and the importance of the technological sublime of photography itself. When memory says, want to do the right thing, don't count on me, then there is a need for report and record, for art and archive a need for the peculiar, problematic face-to-faceness of the photograph. I talk about the face-to-faceness of the photograph, obviously with some ironies, because it is not. It's a highly produced uh, cultural object. But something quite interesting emerges in the testimony of one of the um, accused genocide, genocidaires, and I was just reading these testimonies from one of the most recent reports. It was very interesting to see what he said. He was part of one of these, uh, 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 these genocidal brigades. And then he suggests, he's, and then finally he decides to break with them. What especially drove me to confront the, the murderers is that I had never seen a man killed. So when I saw people run after a man on the hill to kill him, when I saw someone was going to be speared to death, it had a great effect on me. It was clearly unjust. It was as if they were making a mistake about someone in your presence. At that point, you can't help but say that it was wrong. And it seemed to me that the way in which photographs confront you, there's something of this. We know how complex what complex forms of representation photographs are, but they do still maintain something of this face-to-face -face encounter. The way in which this man says, when I saw, in, when something happens in your presence, there's something about this presencing of the photograph, despite the me mechanical reproduction, there's something about its presencing, which is why I've decided to end with these photographs of the taken by a, a photographer during the trials themselves. And this may be a little too early, but when memory says want to do the right thing, don't count on me. There is a need for report and record, for art and archive, a need for the peculiar problematic face-to-faceness of the photograph. What photography and memory share is a belief in the movement of time and history, a process by which the past intrudes into the present and renders it incomplete by displaying what it takes to make a transition between times and places, times that may not be your own, places that may belong to someone else. I'm reminded here also of Walter Benjamin's essay on the short history of photography where he says the whole process of enlargement, enlargement all of a sudden makes something emerge, some, brings something to presence, creates that same presenceness, which was not either absent or present but the way in which the, photog the photograph comes into presence. It's almost a transitional movement, which is what I'm trying to convey to you. 
the stillness of the photograph, we talk about it as still, still photography, is neither passive nor fixed. It is still in the way in which we talk metaphorically about the still deep water, which suggests that the absence of surface movement turns the water into a sharper lens through which we gain a deeper insight, a calmer clarity. The stillness of the image in photography has another symbolic function. It keeps alive the shadow of the past. It acknowledges that something happened, that somebody was killed or somebody was saved. But equally, the movement of the image suggests that the past must be reinterpreted, that there is often a gap between experience and understanding. Mikhail Safdi is a photographer of remarkable stillness and profound movement. Her images of Rwanda take on the task of transition with a skill that deserves that serves both the task of history and the witness of testimony. Safdie's visual strategy has been to treat these trials less as discrete events and more in the spirit of the French word for a trial, a procès, in which the details of everyday life that surround the trial play an important role. Her use of color photography to portray what may be many consider to be a black and white open and shut matter or verdict is both brilliant and provocative. Look, for instance, at the prisoners dressed in pink blouson with their party-colored orange and purple berets at a tilt. Their faces are turned to the camera with hints of suspicion and fear, their eyes fixed on the lens as if it were an instrument of judgment or surveillance. Are these the faces of the genocidaire? Are they all guilty or only some of them? Can there be extenuating circumstances um, after such stupefying crime? At the same time, with courage and subtlety, Safdi turns our eyes to the shirts which flood the frame like a field of spring blossom. Can these be the flowers of evil? The unexpected color suggests, perhaps, that even where there is guilt, there is also life, that the trial must run its course, that where life stirs, there must also be the hope of forgiveness, renewal, and even reform. Amongst the prisoners, you can sometimes see children running into the crowd to greet their fathers, and amongst the ghostly shaved skulls, arranged like so many grotesque eggshells in a museum of extinction, there rises a figure of Christ on the cross. No, sorry. However dark this vision, Safdi quickens it with the ethic of transition. Justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. And Safdi's photographic testimony shows us the difference between doing justice and seeing the law at work in the gachacha process. It is not surprising that in a project based on trials, eyes, looks, gazes, and faces play a large part in the overall design of these images, serving as a recurrent motif of attention and intention. Safdi uses her insight into the stillness of the life of the image to make these eyes speak as victims, oppressors, and witnesses wait for justice to be seen to be done. But the miracle of her art lies in making even the hands of the prisoners, the hands of the prisoners speak. After our eyes have been accosted and arrested by the whites of a thousand Rwandan eyes that witnessed the genocide, our gaze falls upon the pale fingernails of prisoners' hands. Suddenly these fingernails turn into the whites of eyes. Suddenly these fists become faces. Are these the hands of murderers, rapists, genocidal maniacs? Did they think they could grab history from behind and wring its neck? Safdi asks us to pause for a moment. In an ethic of transitionality, neither immediately to accuse, nor to forget, nor to forgive. The work of justice is often wearisome and slow, in the meantime, we should bear in mind the human dimensions of even these hands.
and take to heart the light that dwells in the faces of the survivors who refuse to let the history of their people die with the memory of the massacred. Such then is the art and task of transitional justice. And this is one story of global transition. Thank you. Professor Baba will now take some questions, but please do come, if you will, to the microphone so that we can all hear you. I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, I was wondering, though, about these, uh, about the transitions. They seem to, to be, to, um, they appear as almost a fixed entity, the tra transitions that you talk about. And I'm wondering about manipulations of transitions. Um, in particular, you're, you know, some of the examples you used at the end were the photographs, um, and then you talked about the Tobin tax and um, a way of redistribution through. Um, by taking advantage, essentially, of the transition of, of capital and of, of goods, the flow of goods. But I'm wondering about the possibility of, of uh, photographic manipulation and accounting manipulation and things like that that um, are, are not just, you know, a pure, some kind of a pure ethics of transition, but um, something that is, can affect the category of transition itself. Well. You know, I'm, I'm not suggesting, and I hope I didn't suggest, that transition is a fixed measure. Because in each instance, the, the reason the, 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 the logic of the lecture was to move through different sites of transition, so that in fact they were not identical. In each moment there was a, in, in, there was a different kind of notion of transition being, uh, being dealt with. Um, in the uh, early critique of, say, Hart and Negri, in the critique of Hart and Negri, um, the, the notion of a transitional measure was being set up precisely against their notion of immeasurability. Uh, as, you, as I moved on, the notion of, in, through the notion of intertemporal equity, I, I used the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the um, Adrian Rich to talk about the way in which repetition memory and public record work uh, and, and the, the way in which the unsatisfaction, the throwing back the question of uh, representation and memory then creates a different kind of structure of, of transition. With Gramsci, the transitional moment is the moment when you are, as he puts it, just below the qualitative level of the state in a body of people, what he calls a political front, the ethical political front that is continually expanding and changing. It doesn't quite know what its parameters are, but subalternity emerges out of that unknowing. If the one is unsatisfaction, it's partly out of that unknowing. He says, if you know too well, if you think you know too well always what the, uh, what the structure of the state is, then you create yourself in a mimetic measure in relation to that. And finally, in terms of the, uh, of, of the Rwandan trials, there's, I mean, quite literally a historical kind of transition or hiatus at the moment where uh, evidence is being gained, where the whole question of who is guilty and who is not guilty, which is, of course, one of the problems of transitional justice. Um, uh, you know, transitional justice is, in a sense, less like the um, uh, Trotsky's transitional program, you know, marking clear um, moments towards a progress. It's more about this kind of who is guilty, who is not guilty, who is an observer. These are the questions that are being worked out in the uh, process, which is why I presented these uh, images where, for instance, the pink shirt, you know, prisoners dressed cockily in pink shirts, you know, is a completely different kind of color palette to our understanding of the, of the issue, uh, which, which, which has in fact uh, horrified 
many, many people. You know, there's a, a whole critique of these gachacha trials. They say that the people who are being held are being looked after much better. Uh, and although they're the, the, they are guilty of genocide, they're being looked after and maintained in this whole process of information gathering much, um, you know, with, with, with great care and much better than they, they deserve. So the talk opened up at, at different levels, tried to move across from, you know, cultural studies and its notion of globalization to, to, to the actual the poetry or the poetics or the poesis of globalization to the notion of who is the subject, the subaltern subject, and then finally the representation. That was the stretch of it. So that each one of those was actually different, not just uh, uh, repeating the same thing. But of course, um, as I ended, uh, you know, I think I responded uh, to your question, which is that I ended with a whole set of interrogate, in, interrogatory questions, you know, as to how do we, uh, how will we know uh, who is guilty and who is not guilty and what level of participation, so that the moment of transition, of course, can be manipulated. And this is, uh, certainly in, the, in, in Rwanda, this is one of the major debates at the moment, you know, that are such states of time and being and history manipulatable? And, and they are, and there is no way to uh, avoid them in advance. You know, there could, be, there are, of course, I'm talking philosophically, of course there are certain institutional structures, etc., that you can use to direct them. Of course you can. But it's by getting, the thing that interests me about transition is how, by getting into the issue, by, by being in the midst of the flow, you then create the, the norms with which you uh, d define and find some direction. So they can be they can be manipulated, but till you open out this space, this for me this problematic space of globalization, till you open it out and see how it is, see its problems, till you do that, I think you either get into a, a much more for or against sort of position. And of course there are variations along that, but I think the problem is really to open up this space of transition and see how, uh, where you can work with it. And of course today I was only presenting a, a set of uh, uh, signposts to that. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, about a picture of the Rwandans, I don't know, I think you should revisit the author of the photograph to find out. I counted three or four people wearing those pink bandanas, and I noticed that they had these round logos with the fleur de lis on, on, on their caps. That is a general sign of the Boy Scout uh, mm -hmm. in many parts of Africa. So it might actually be that these are people who have been drafted to help keep order among the prisoners. No, no they're not actually, if they're not. If you read the uh, um, uh, amnesty report, which is just come out, they're not. They actually, they're not there to keep. They, they have worn these particular clothes themselves, though okay. a, whole, a whole batch of the prisoners have actually worn these particular pink uh, clothes. Is there any reason? No, they, um, they, 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 they were issued with them. One version is that they were issued with these uh, um, clothes in their, you know, in the uh, place where they are kept under confinement. Um, but I've also read another report recently that uh, they, some of them had some, you know, had some of these, which may have well have been from their own days in the Boy Scout movement or something of that kind. And that they are very meticulous about, you know, appearing with in these clothes at these events of the case. Well, uh, th those things are clearly uniforms, uh, mm. and whether they were issued with days initially, mm. or this is a projection that that they, that comes out of an actual organizational right. structure, mm. perhaps of the genocide there, you know, uh, it is still very evident that these are uniforms of some kind. Right. Therefore, their meanings are absolutely very important, you know based on the desire to project this uniform, even in the middle of these kinds of trial. Right. Ru Ru Rwanda is a place where, as in many parts of Africa, uh, cloth, you know, does make a demand. 
and this is a very important aspect. But this is not my question. Um, the, the, the term transition, as you use it, aside from its regular semantic meanings, which I kind of find interesting now, I pick up the university's uh, regular news sheet for faculty, and I'm always very startled when I open the page and see this section titled Transitions. This university? Yes, we, 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 which in my mind always says dying or dead person. Uh, it says what? Which in my mind always refers to dead people, you know, the passage oh, from, passing. from life to death. But then you find out that these are people who are actually transferred from one <laughs> office to another. So, I don't, if anybody is here who works with that, you know, publication, please change it. It drives me nuts. <laughs> I, I, I can't understand that. Uh, the thing that bothers me about all of this, globalization and these transitional processes, as you rightly point out, people are not transitioning into transition as a state of being. They are moving. This is a liminal process. They are moving from point A to point B, even in instances where they do not know what right. point B is. The transitional process, being a liminal Correct. process, uh, is something that cannot be subsisted in. Any impulse to live in transition you know, as a sort of nomadic conceptualization of existence. It's a Thanatos impulse, it's a death wish. You cannot live in a transition. You pass through transition to points, you know, that are then determined by very specific power constructs, the power of the state mm -hmm. to identify you as a person who either belongs or does not. Um, there is this larger issue, which refers to the first transition I mentioned, that death is often the consequence of this movement for people who do not belong in the right cultural and political sphere. The migrants who walk from Rwanda to Europe, you know, through the Sahara Desert in an effort to get to Italy, where they end up in those camps, you know, where they are held for six months and a year without any kind of adjudication. They are dying in many ways. The people who are walking across the Arizona desert, you know, from Mexico into the United right. States. So th there is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is on the politics of power itself. The ability of these states, you know, to define who transitions is something that is now wielded overwhelmingly by what has become a club. Uh, the, the outsourcing, in other words, of the colonial enterprise that the United States is invested in right at this point with the support of its quote-unquote European allies is again an instance of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What my question is, mm -hmm. is, you know, where, where, do, where do the poor people, where do they fit into in all of this? I mean, this idea that you can elicit a kind of justice by appointing a United Nations-based organization is something that emerges for the first time in fully fledged form in South Africa, where you pay the Jews for having been killed by the Europeans, but then you say to the black people, well, we're sorry, but you know, let's move on. Let's transition from this position. What, what, you are speaking about the ethics of yeah. power. Let me just say, what is the ethics it, it, but of the three quarters, your first three points basically repeated exactly what I had said. Your first three points, and I appreciate you repeated exactly what I've said, that the question of, that one has to accept that there is a process of transition, but as I said in my talk, people who are in transition then settle somewhere. They make some demands, they're part of some, uh, they're part of some jurisdiction. They have to make, they, 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 they sue for their rights etc. So it's, I'm perfectly in agreement with that. That's, the, that, that's the, very much the sense of, of what I've said today. Um, the, the, question, the, uh, the question that is raised, however, is whether the end point resolves the transition or produces some other implications. And that's the, 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 the place that I open up uh, in, in terms of what I call the ethical the, the ethical um, basis of rights, even in post, and I, here I agree with uh, Amartya Sen, that uh, there is a way in which uh, an ethical perspective presupposes the right, even when the institution at the moment may not be able to satisfy it. I think this is part of human aspiration, and this is part of political aspiration, and I think this is very crucial. So that it would be wrong to say that the point at which the transition, at which citizenship is granted, in a way the act of transition ends. I think it would be wrong to say that because the point at which citizenship is granted a whole set of other issues uh, uh, precisely to do with, the, with one's passage 
through a new society also begin. And the emphasis, and the emphasis on transition in globalization, in my view, is to, is to not allow the narrative to close down. It is to not allow the narrative to develop one particular view uh, of, from, from one end or the other. You talk about outsourcing, and of course outsourcing is a, is a, is a problem at, at many levels. I'm doing some work on outsourcing at, at the moment, and I've been interviewing some people who work in outsourcing in Bombay, which is a very big center for outsourcing. The interesting thing is, to, to, to persist with the metaphor of transition, as to how they see it precisely as part of a transitional process to, um, to uh, achieve a certain end at the point at which they are aware something else will open. I was talking to uh, one of these people and I said, well, you know, this outsourcing is, is, a, is a form of exploitation for you too. Uh, you know that you're only paid a fraction of what you would be paid. You know that you are, you know, there's all this identity transformation that goes on. They're made to speak different languages, speak in a different way, assume different identities. I said, so what does it feel like? I said, people call this, a, you know, a, a new construction of the coolie. I said, people say this is a new kind of colonialism. And uh, the point is that, yes, of course, I accept that. But it is one of the best deals you can get at the moment if you want to work at night earn much better than you would and go to college during the day in Bombay. So, I, so that way of thinking of, what the, of how the person who is in that process of outsourcing makes this decision interests me considerably. From the outside we would say, as I said to him, you know, this is a terrible exploitation, why do you want to go along with it? This is, you know, a, a form of cultural transformation, whatever, you know, the kind of arguments that we would make. It's interesting to see how he was negotiating what I would call this moment of transition in a very clever way. So I want to go back in a way to the question earlier on. That is also a strategic negotiation of transition, just as the, I bring in the Gachacha trials because it in, in, is a critique, in a way, of the UN uh, court. You know, they located it in Arusha to start with, they've located it, you know, completely away from where the people were. I think out of uh, um, the three, they, in, in two, three years they gave three, they, they gave three judgments on three cases having spent 90 million dollars. And I don't want to just be blindly critical of the process, you know, there might be a lot to be said. These are very complicated issues. So, and, but what interested me was that out of the three judgments that they gave, only one was ever translated. So that, you know, African people generally and the Rwandans could even read what had happened. The other, you know, they're, they're published in French and English. So it seemed to me that the Gachaja trials was a good place to show how transitional justice, with all its problems, also has to find its own measure of discourse and its own measure, its own place, and how it, despite the problems, and there are many problems as you well know if you follow the, you know, the websites and the regular information, there are many problems. The participation is very low, people feel very exposed, they feel there's, there isn't a kind of a security network, there, there are many criticisms of it. But on the other hand, it seemed to me that it was a good place to end, where on the one hand you have a kind of a global idea of justice brought in with the UN uh, International Court, and then you have that doesn't work in certain st ways, certain strategic ways it does, but it doesn't work in other ways. And then you have this response of trying to create a sense of agency and yet deal with a, a profound transitional uncertainty. It seems to me it's, uh, it's, it, it, it raises all the questions in a way that I wanted to raise of the irresolution, but of a step ahead, you know, trying to, to mark some kind of uh, movement, uh, some kind of positive movement there in the legal process and in also in the emotional process.